This is Courtney Hicks, and I have been given the honor of being the Senior Warden for St. Thaddeus for this year. I want to welcome you to the service this morning and let you know how much I miss us being able to get together and do these services in person so that we can greet each other, pray together, give those wonderful hugs that I love to give and to give. So um, until we are able to meet in person again, be safe and um, take care of one another. Thanks so much for your time.
Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Look over yonder, and what do you see? Coming for to carry me home. Just follow me down to Jordan Stream. Coming for to carry me, wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's a gonna trouble the water. See that host all dressed in white. God's a gonna trouble the water. A band of angels carrying the light. God's a gonna trouble the water. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home, the brightest day that I can say. Coming for to carry me home, when Jesus washed my sins away. Coming for to carry me home, swing low to the water that will always carry you home. Swing low to the water that will always carry you home. I'm sometimes up and sometimes down, coming for to carry me home. But still I know I'm heavenly bound, coming for to carry me, wade in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's a gonna trouble the water.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's a beautiful day and a great day to worship together with um, all the great folks from St. Albans and St. Thaddeus. I hope everyone has had a good weekend so far. Um, one of the things I like about you folks, everyone I've met at both uh, parishes, is you're such authentic people. You're the same people in worship. You're the same people at church. You're the same people volunteering. You're the same people at home in the community. You are what you are, authentic Christians. And I, I deeply appreciate that. And that's one reason why I am here. So join me in worshiping this morning. Thank you.
Blessed is the king who Blessed comes the king in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and, and glory in the highest. Glory in the highest. Let us pray. Let us pray. Assist us. Assist us mercifully with your hope, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life you have given us and immortality. And immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Gospel A reading from the Gospel of Luke. After telling a parable, to the, telling a parable Jericho, to the crowd at Jericho, Jesus went on ahead, Jesus going, up on ahead going up to Jerusalem. He had come near Bethphage, come near and, Bethphage, Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount, the place of, called the Mount of, of Olives. Two of the he sent saying, two of the disciples go saying, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, just say this. The Lord needs it. So those who were sent, so those who were sent departed, departed and found it as He had told them. As they were untying, as they were untying the colt, his, his owners why asked are them, "Why the are you untying the colt?" They said, "They said the Lord needs it." The Lord needs it. Then they brought it. To then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their, and after cloaks, throwing their the cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on. They set Jesus on. As He rode along, as He rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As He was now approaching, as He was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had. Saying, saying, blessed is, blessed the, king is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees, in the, of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along the way. Let these branches that we hold be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name May ever hail him as follow our king way, and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. Lives and reigns in the glory. Who lives and reigns in the glory you and Holy with you and now Holy Spirit and now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes. Blessed is he who Lord. comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the, Hosanna highest. In the so highest. Let us go forth wait, wait, wait. in peace. Let's, let's so. This is a triumphal okay. entry. This is a triumphal entry, everybody. Blessed is he who comes. Blessed is he who Lord. comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us go forth now let us go forth in peace. Bells.
That's the Lord who forgives all our sins. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in his way of suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. You may be seated. I want to invite the children to come forward at this time for our children's homily. All right. Hey, Karina. Hey. Kind of This is a long one today. So we are still in Lent. We're in the last Sunday of Lent. And during this time, we're drawing really close to the mystery of Easter. And we have been on a journey these last six weeks. Has it been six weeks? It's getting there. Wow. So we started this journey with baby Jesus being born, and he's looking up into Mother Mary and Father Joseph, and he sees the cross. And then, Jesus was 12, and he was in the temple, and he was asking the priests questions, and he was listening to their answers, but then they were asking him questions, and he was answering, and they were amazed at his knowledge, and And then, Jesus was about 30, and he was baptized by John. And when that happened, a dove came down and came really close to Jesus. And then, Jesus went into the desert, and he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. And he meditated on the work that was before him. And it, during this time, there was no food, there was no water, and he was tempted by the devil. And the devil, the last temptation that he had was, he took him up on this high pinnacle top and showed him all the kingdoms in the world and said, I can give you all of these if you follow me. And Jesus said, no, I am to be a king but not that kind of king. Levi, can you pull that for me? Thank you. And then, Jesus set out to do his work, to heal people and to teach people and to come really close to people like he did to this man here that was blind. He came so close that he touched his eyes. And he healed them. Can you pull it again, Levi? All right. So today's story is about Jesus turning back to Jerusalem for the last time. And when he was entering into Jerusalem, people thought he was coming to be their king. And so they, it was super busy. It was the Feast of the Passover, and all these people were excited because they thought he was coming to be their king. But then Jesus rode in on a donkey, and that was not very kingly. But people still gathered palm branches and waved them around like we just did this morning because that was to show that he was a king. On Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday that week, he taught in the temple and he taught in his parables, and he taught a lot of things. But some people were starting to get angry and worried about this Jesus. And so on Thursday, um, and then every night, they would go up to the Mount of Olives and rest 
and eat together, him and the 12 disciples. And some people would say that angels would be at the bottom rocks of the Mount of Olives, protecting Jesus from the Roman soldiers. But then Thursday came, and Judas, one of the 12, had gone and told the Roman soldiers where he could find Jesus, where they could arrest him. And so the Roman soldiers said, okay, we'll arrest him on Thursday. Well, Thursday morning and afternoon came, and Jesus could not be found. But that night, Jesus and the twelve walked through the streets of Jerusalem to a house that was on this dark street, and they went upstairs, and they had a meal together, the Last Supper. And in that meal, after everybody had eaten, he took the bread, and he thanked God for it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take this, and do this in remembrance of me. And he handed it out to the twelve, and they ate the bread. And then he picked up the wine, and he thanked God for it, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you. Take this and do this in remembrance of me. So the disciples did it, but then they were confused because why would we need to remember Jesus? He was here to be our king. It's very strange things Jesus was saying this night. So they left the house and they were walking back to the Mount of Olives and Jesus stopped at the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And he went over and prayed and then he walked back to the twelve, and he said to them, why are you not praying? And they, they were very confused this whole time because Jesus was acting strange. They didn't understand why they needed to pray. Like he was here to be their king celebrating. So Jesus went back to the garden and prayed again, and as he was walking back, Judas started coming forward to give Jesus a kiss. That was a normal thing to greet him. But then Jesus backed up, and he goes, Jesus, why have you betrayed me? Why have you betrayed the Son of Man? And then they were all surrounded. And the disciples were thinking, whoa, what should we do? We're surrounded by the Roman soldiers. There's elders here. There's priests here. And they were all there to arrest Jesus. And they arrested him. And then the twelve disappeared into the dark night. And that is where our story ends. So I wonder what has been the most important part of the story so far. They're all thinking really hard. Yeah. <laughs> the most important part for me is wondering what's going to happen next. Because mm -hmm. we have one more part of the story. I wonder, what are we not understanding? What are we missing that would help us fully understand? Like the disciples didn't understand. Is that your baby, Tessa? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she knows what she, is going she's on. She's just answering she's telling the questions. Us about it. I wonder what you have to do to get ready for next Sunday. I wonder what next Sunday is. Easter. It's Easter. I wonder what we have to do to get ready for Easter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe make some Easter eggs. Yeah. Maybe hide some chocolate. Maybe spend some time with our family. I wonder what we have to do. So all of you are now going to go with Kenzie, and she's got a Palm Sunday activity, um, and then you'll come back when we do communion. And if there's anybody out there who did not want to come up but wants to participate in the Palm Sunday activity, you're welcome to do that. Thank you, Levi. Thanks, everybody.
Lord. The glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, when the hour for the Passover meal came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to those that by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, The kings of the, of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and leader like me who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has, has demanded to, to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fall. And you, 
when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, Tell you, Peter, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. He said to them, when I sent you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, No, no not, a, not thing. a thing. But now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag. And the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, the scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless, and indeed, what is written about me is being fulfilled. Lord, look, look here, here are the two swords. swords. It is enough. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the line of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, Lord should, should we, we strike with, with the sword? sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priest, the officers of the temple, police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and your power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know you. I do not know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man also is with them, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? They kept heaping many other insults on him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together, and they brought him to their council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. If I tell you, you will not believe, and if I question you, you will not ask. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, Are you, are you then the Son of God? Say that I am. What sort of testimony, testimony do we need? We have heard it from ourselves from his own lips. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, 
We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Are you the king of the Jews? You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, He serves up the people by teaching them throughout all Judea, from Galilee to Judea, even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to see him for a long time, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priest and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is perverting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us! This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they had asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But, but Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and have wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nurse. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this, when the need is great, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sense of condemnment? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. 
But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I condemn my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this, was, this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I want to tell you how happy I am to, to be able to preach to you today here at St. Albans. While I really miss my own church home, but being with you reminds me of those trips my family would take to relatives during the holidays. You know, it, it wasn't quite home. It was kind of different, but it was still family. Being with you all is feeling like family. It, it's not St. Thaddeus, but we're all together, and we're all family. Well, here we are. We finally made it. It's Palm Sunday, the edge of Holy Week the last leg in our journey through Lent this year together. I don't know about you, but I am ready for Lent to be over. I really struggle with my Lenten commitments every year. I struggle to do those extra things that I've committed to, and I struggle not to do the things that I have given up. I'd like to think that most people struggle during Lent. It, it would make me feel better about my own shortcomings. I do have one friend that never looks at Lent as a struggle. I think about her a lot during Lent. She's a friend of mine from Bowling Green. I'll call her Mary. Mary is a fitting name for her because she is one of those people that would much prefer sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him talk, than to be wrapped up in the cares and distractions of the world. I think of Mary because Mary has this unique perspective on Lent, a perspective that I don't quite share or get. In fact, I have a confession to make. But you've got to remember when I tell you this, that I'm telling you this under the seal of confidentiality. You cannot tell anybody 
It's on the internet, Dave. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> I do not like Lent. In fact, it would not be a stretch to say that I hate Lent, but not Mary. Mary loves Lent. Mary tells me all the time that Lent is one of her favorite seasons of the year. We'll try and figure that piece out together later. But first, I want to look at the gospel reading today. Not the passion, but the reading from Luke. I have heard this reading a lot over the years. In fact, for those that are keeping a scorecard, I have heard this reading every three years since I've been going to Episcopal churches. And I'll bet you have too. And I've heard this gospel preached a lot in those times. And there seems to be these two reoccurring themes that come out of those sermons. The most predominant goes something like this. You've got the city of David, Jerusalem. On one side of the city, you've got Pontius Pilate and the full force of the Roman army. They've got their war horses and their swords and their armor and those helmets with the bristle brush things sticking up out of the top. And on the other side, you've got Jesus, dressed in a peasant's robe, riding on a donkey with a crowd of poor common folk behind him. Both sides are headed towards each other, towards the center of the city, where the temple and the Roman garrison are. It's a classic David versus Goliath, good versus evil, right versus might. And we know how this story ends on Good Friday. And we know the ultimate victory that happens on Easter morning. Another theme that I hear, although it's less predominant, is normally preached by those high intellectual types, Robert. The type that are really into ancient Jewish custom and tradition. This theme usually requires a bit of setup. So the preacher will give you a bit of background. In the old days of Jewish kings, it was the custom and practice that when the king conquered a neighboring territory, he would ride through that territory, not with his army or on his war horse or with his armor, but just dressed in his normal clothes on a donkey or a mule. He was making a statement that this territory was now so completely in his control, he had nothing to fear. Nobody was going to do anything to hurt him. This was what the people expected Jesus to do. This was their expectation of their Messiah King. And when Jesus failed to live up to that expectation, they turned against him. And this led to his struggles the remainder of Holy Week and ultimately to his arrest and crucifixion. I thought about preaching on one of these two themes. You know, sticking with the classics. But then, as I read the gospel in preparation for this sermon, another theme started speaking to me. Or, as, as my Baptist friends might say, God was laying something different on my heart. I started hearing a theme of trust. First, you had the complete trust of the disciples when Jesus told them to go into town and untie a complete stranger's donkey and bring it back to them. And the only assurance he gives them that they weren't going to wind up locked up is some words. Tell them the Lord needs it. Robert, I like you and all, but if you tell me to go down to the local car lot and hop in an Escalade and bring it back to you, and if I get stopped, all I have to say is the Lord needs it, 
I'm afraid I'm going to have to get that a hard pass. <laughs> Next, we've got the trust of the owner of the donkey. He trusted two complete strangers simply because of the words that Jesus told them to tell him. Somehow, those words told him that these were servants of God and that they were going to do the right thing. I'm not sure I'm down with that one either. I mean, how would you feel if a stranger came up to your house, hopped in your car, and started to drive off with it, and said, hey man, it's good, the Lord needs it. I think I might call 911. Finally, we've got the trust that the crowd had in Jesus to keep them safe in a dangerous situation. That whole stone singing business, we're, we're not talking a scene out of Jesus Christ's superstore. Jesus was warning that there was going to be a riot if this crowd was stifled. And Rome only has one way of dealing with riots. Trust that the words of Jesus can protect Trust that the servants of God will do the right thing. Trust that Jesus is able to protect in the face of danger. Friends, there's one more example of trust I'd like to share with you today, and this is kind of last minute, and I apologize, because it's going to carry my sermon a little longer than I had anticipated. It has nothing to do with the story of Mary, and it has nothing to do with the gospel reading. But I want to share with you the trust of a German Lutheran preacher during World War II. Yesterday was the feast of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. For those of you that don't know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is, talk to Robert after the service. He will tell you all about him. But here's my simple explanation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran minister living in Nazi Germany during World War II. He opposed the Nazi regime, and ultimately he participated in a plot to overthrow Adolf Hitler. When this plot was discovered, he was arrested, thrown in a concentration camp, and ultimately, he was executed for treason. Now, I thought about reading a piece of poetry that he wrote while he was in that concentration camp. But I am no poet, and I do not have a voice for poetry. And having seen some brilliant poetry read from that pulpit, I am not about to compete with that. I will share you this with you, though. Bonhoeffer said, early in his life, he felt that opposition to authority was wrong and was against God's will. But his experiences in Nazi Germany taught him that sometimes when authority is so completely wrong, you have to resist that wrongness, and that is absolutely God's will. Now back to our regularly scheduled sermon. So what does all of this trust have to do with our story about men? Well, just this. Many years ago, Mary and I and a group of members from Christ Church Bowling Green took a mission trip to El Salvador. It had been 10 years since a major earthquake had devastated almost all of that country. And Episcopal Relief and Development was still sending people there to help rebuild. Just before our mission trip, I was given a secret mission assignment that nobody could know about, especially not Mary. Mary was many things, but street smart was not one of them. Mary was the type that would wander down the back streets off of Dodds Avenue at night, not realizing how much danger she was in. My task was to watch over Mary and keep her from getting herself kidnapped or killed 
or worse. And I got to tell you, I wasn't sure that I could keep Mary out of trouble in El Salvador. And this wasn't something I wanted to do. But Mary's husband was one of my best friends. And I don't think I could face him if something bad were to have happened to Mary. So I agreed. When we first got to El Salvador, this was easy. We spent the first few days in a gated compound with armed guards and serpentine wire. There was no way Mary was going to get into trouble then. Next, we were taken to a remote village that could only be accessed by a single dirt road. I started to relax. I thought this was going to be easy, all that worry for nothing. But, like the Jimmy Buffett song says, just when you least expect it, the dragons come to call. As luck would have it, our host decided to give us a break from our labors and took us to a private beach club owned by one of the rich members of the church. When we got to the beach, our escorts, two young men with rifles, told us not to wander off, to stay on the property, and that the neighboring properties were not safe. Easy enough. So there we were, pretending to be more like tourists than missionaries, when one of the young men tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, not safe, and pointed. And I looked to where he pointed, and there was Mary, by herself, and clearly in OB. For those of you that don't play golf, OB stands for out of bounds. It's a place where you do not want your golf ball to be, and a place where Mary shouldn't have been. So I set down my adult beverage and quickly ran after her and said, Mary, what are you doing? It is not safe for you to be out here alone. Friends, she did not hesitate. She looked me right in the eye and said, Dee, I am never alone. God is always with me. At that moment, I realized that one of us was a whole lot more streetwise than the other. One of us was looking to two young men with rifles for protection. The other was looking to God. Mary's belief that God was with her, would never leave her alone, and was going to protect her on that dangerous beach came because Mary had complete and total trust in God. The days, weeks, and months following that event, I began to realize Mary's secret. I began to realize why Lent was Mary's favorite season of the year. Mary had discovered the true purpose of Sabbath rest something most Episcopalians don't quite get. But if it's any consolation, I don't think the Jews of Jesus' day quite got it either. Mary was able to trust God to be with her and keep her safe because Mary had spent time working on her relationship with God. That is the true purpose of Sabbath rest for us to work on our relationship with God. Let me ask you a question. How many of you that are married out there met your spouse the day you got married? A lot of arranged marriages out there? No? No, no I didn't think so. No, I'll bet before you got married, you spent time with each other going on dates, getting to know each other working on your relationship. I'll also bet that when you were on those dates, you spent most of that time focused on each other and not thinking about what you were sacrificing or giving up to be on that date. That is what Sabbath rest is. And Mary 
had discovered that for her, Lent was her Sabbath time. Her time to work on her relationship with God so that she could completely trust him to be with her and to never leave her and to keep her safe, even on a dangerous beach. I am still not very good at using Lent as Sabbath time to work on my relationship with God, but I am trying to get better at it. My hope and my prayer for you this Holy Week is that you find some time for Sabbath rest to work on your own relationship with God so that you can completely trust him to be with to never leave you alone and to keep you safe even on a dangerous beach. Amen. Amen. Now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Standing or kneeling as you are comfortable. Most, Most merciful God, God we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly agree. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. We abide in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Hello and welcome and good morning. I invite you to be seated. Welcome to folks who are joining us on the internet. And welcome to folks who are joining us here on Palm Sunday. Uh, a big, big welcome to all of you. If you are new to us and you're here, uh, you can fill out a little card on the back of your pew. You turn that in and we'll send you information about St. Thaddeus and about St. Albans. Um, and if you're joining us on the internet, uh, the information about how to get in touch with us by email uh, will be presented to you on the screen, so uh, please reach out, because we want to learn how to be Jesus with you, be, be Christ in the world with you. I, I need to announce a couple of things, but first I want to say a big thank you to our lay preacher, D. Taylor, who I think broke history or made history today by quoting the two patron saints, Bonhoeffer and Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> oh, never happened in a sermon before. Kudos to you, sir. Good job. A um, couple things to be aware of. There are... Oh, oh Simon. <laughs> Buddy. I'm sorry. This has never happened before. Um, it's okay, Bud. But 
Uh, there are a lot of Holy Week offerings, and I would like for you to take a look in your bulletin. Uh, and they've changed since last Sunday uh, because of the power situation at Thaddeus, which is quickly improving. Um, so stay tuned about that. But there are wonderful opportunities on Tuesday, on Thursday, on Friday, and on Saturday. And I just want to commend to you to think about, maybe you can't join all of those opportunities, um, but maybe to find one or two um, that are suiting to your schedule, that are in between your moments of Sabbath uh, this Holy Week, but are good opportunities to move uh, sincerely into the mystery of the Easter season. Um, next Sunday on Easter, uh, we will have a 9 a.m. 9 a.m. potluck brunch. And so I invite you to that. Bring um, um, something to share or don't. Just come and be with us. Um, and then there's a 10.30 choral Eucharist and then after that Eucharist is an Easter egg hunt. Yes. It's going to be grand. And one of those Easter eggs will be hidden all the works of Jimmy Buffett. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There won't, will not be. But it will be fun nonetheless. So, Oh, buddy. All right. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in an offering and a sacrifice to the most. <laughs>
Stand with us to sing the doxology, please. Praise God. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for our sins he was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels, archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sang this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as 
we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. of God, come taste and see that God is good.
God, Heavenly Father, you have the great grace to accept us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love, love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Friends, go forth into the world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen those who are faint-hearted and support folks in need. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you this day and remain with you all days.